But brethren, in looking at this where we are and what are we doing as Christians, are we emulating the one we call God? Are we emulating with our personal lives the one we call God? We have a very, very high calling from that standpoint. If you'd turn with me to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 48. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 48. I like to read here in the NIV here, this particular Matthew 5 and verse 48. It says this, and Jesus is being quoted as saying this. It says, of course, translated in English, Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. The Amplified Version puts it this way. You, therefore, must be perfect, growing into complete maturity of godliness in mind and character, having reached the proper height of virtue and integrity, as your heavenly Father is perfect. That's quite a, that's quite a, uh, uh, a mission statement. You know, we talk about mission statements, and that's quite a mission statement. It says, growing into complete maturity of godliness in mind and character, having reached the proper height of virtue and integrity. I'd like, to cons- I'd like us to think about this a little bit. We're going to be talking about this whole idea of emulating, really, the one who is called... God, the one whom we call God and, and worship, and talk about a little bit about his, per, about his personality, about his character that we are to emulate, that we are to copy. I mean, it's a high calling. If God, when if Jesus is saying to us that we have to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect, let's face it, we've got our homework cut out for us, don't we? We, we really do. If, if we're honest with ourselves and not kidding ourselves, I want to I wanna, start here. Um, Let's go to John 4. John chapter 4. I'm reading uh, here out of the, for the most part, out of the New Revised Standard, the NRSV. But John chapter 4. I want to read here this this particular passage in Scripture and think a little bit about this, of being perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus is making and baptizing more disciples than John. So the Pharisees were, and this is interesting. Now, we've known for a long time, uh, Pharisees, you read through the Gospels, the Pharisees were quite often opponents um, of what Jesus was having to teach. What I find interesting is, is that when we look at this in the Jewish community right now, how they look at the Pharisees, the more nationalistic Jews these days look upon the Pharisees as ancient collaborators of the Romans. They look at them as people who sold out to the occupying power of the day, which I think was kind of, kind of interesting, uh, that that is, in the Jewish community, there are those who have that view of the Pharisees, that these were just people who were operating hand and, and glove with the Romans. The enemies, the pagan Roman Empire, they weren't friends of the people of God. That sometimes comes as a little bit of a shock to people that Rome, that these people were not friends of the people of God, but that's the way it was. So when, when the Pharisees, these people who operated with the Romans, heard that Jesus is making and baptizing more disciples than John, in other words, he's the important one now who is being used and is creating a stir, although it was not Jesus himself, but his disciples who baptized. So Jesus was actually having his disciples do the actual baptizing. And maybe there's a reason for that. He left Judea and started back to Galilee. So he left where it might have been politically dangerous for him, and he was going back to Galilee. But he had to go through Samaria, which is geographically where you have to go. If you're going to leave Judea and you're going to go up to Galilee, you have to walk through this area, which is in the, what we call the West Bank now. And you had to go through this area called Samaria. 
So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. I've actually had the privilege of being there, and actually sitting on this well as well, because what they, um, it's still there. In fact, um, during the British mandate, they actually went down and dug it out because uh, it had been substantially filled in over the years by pilgrims that would come by and toss a pebble in for good luck. And, you know, this was a problem because the local populace still used, were still using the water to drink from. And a well like this is dug down into, down to a, a, a level of the, in the rock where you have a, a water table where you have water. And they would let down ropes and bring it up in the fashion of the Middle East. And I had a chance, this was back in 1972, to actually go and, and visit this area. Now I think it would be a lot more, you'd, you'd be putting a lot more risk. It's a lot less unsettled, obviously, if you read the news in this area. So it was about noon. So it was hot. Typically when you're traveling in that part of the country and you've been walking for a couple hours, you're thirsty and you're tired. And Jesus came and there's a little bit of a, a rock wall around the well for, to protect it and to keep the water clean. And he was just sitting on it, okay? He came and sat down. And a Samaritan woman came to draw water and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. His disciples had gone into the city to buy food. Now, both of these things was a rather radical perspective because, first of all, the Jews and the Samaritans weren't great friends. There had been a lot of rivalry historically for hundreds and hundreds of years. And for Jesus to, in this case, uh, to send us, of course, you had to go through this area, but I want you to know that there was a lot of, you know, a lot of antagonism between the two. I mean, during the time of the Maccabees, the uh, when Judas Maccabeus was, was rising in power, they had actually gone there and destroyed the Samaritan temple. The Samaritans were a syncretistic, um, had a syncretistic religion where they had elements of paganism and, and elements of the true religion. Their, their Bible itself was just the Pentateuch. It wasn't, didn't have the prophets. It didn't have the writings. Uh, so there was, there was a lot of antagonism between the two communities at that time. Verse 9, the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? The Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. And there was, typically they considered it that you would become ritually unclean if you touched or took something from a Samaritan. And Jesus obviously wasn't too concerned about that himself personally. And Jesus said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. And the woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. You have to have a bucket and a rope to let down to get your water. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us this well, and with his sons and his flocks to drink from it? Because the Samaritans, were, uh, they had been brought back by the Assyrians, at this point, more than 700 years earlier, and they had married a, a couple Israelites, uh, pagan, well, fall, you know, priests that uh, had done the Israelite religion. They had brought them back, and they had assumed from that standpoint or developed the idea that, that they were Israelite, although they were a mixed people, and at best, just as, just a, you know, their DNA would have just been a very small amount. The rest of it, they came from Mesopotamia. They, it says that very clearly. They were people that the Assyrians had brought in from other places to settle this area after they had exiled the, the northern ten tribes. Did Jesus argue with her? Verse 13, Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. So this is the promise. Jesus is saying, telling this woman very clearly. She's a Samaritan woman. He's telling her that he, God is offering a gift, a gift of eternal life, living water. 
The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to come, uh, keep coming here to draw water, which was a lot of work. She didn't get the point. Okay, she was thinking in a materialistic, literalistic fashion. Verse 16, and Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come back. And the woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, You're right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. See, she was living, just living with him. At that time, the rabbis would have said if a woman had been divorced two or three times, that was sort of like the maximum. If you're having more partners than two or three, he would consider them, and this woman was saying five, and she's, she's, uh, she's living with one that's not her husband, she, she would have been considered by that society a very immoral woman uh, at that time. What you have said is true, Jesus said. The woman said to him, Sir, I see you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where our people must worship is in Jerusalem. And Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. Now, that's an interesting statement. Most people uh, who are in the Christian, who, who profess themselves to be Christians, do not know this, and they do not consider this. Verse 23 but the hour is coming, and now is here, when the true worshipers, the true worshipers, will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The New Living Translation takes this verse 24 and puts it, says, For God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The message puts it this way. It's, you, it's who you are and the way you live that counts before God. Your worship must engage your spirit in the pursuit of truth. That's the kind of people the Father is out looking for. Those who are simply and honestly themselves before him in their worship. God is sheer being itself, spirit. Those who worship him must do it out of their very being, their spirits, their true selves, in adoration. God, you see, is spirit. If you want to say he's sheer being. And when he is, he's totally sincere and honest and straightforward, transparent, we would use the word nowadays. If we're going to be perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect, it will be because in our worship we will do things in that same simple, honest way when we come before God in how we both worship and how we live. And that we will have our spirit engaged in the pursuit of truth as well. Because that's what God's spirit is engaged in. It's engaged in in the truth. It's engaged in seeking what is pure. Going back here to John 4, in verse 25, the woman, the Samaritan woman, said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Because the Samaritans believed, because they had the Pentateuch in the Samaritan Bible. They had the first five books of the Bible. And of course, it talks there that there would be a prophet that would come in along that would be like Moses. So they understood there was going to be a redeemer. They understood that there was going to be someone like this. They didn't necessarily think of him as the son of God necessarily. But they, they had that concept. And she's saying, yeah, I know Messiah is coming. And when he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. In verse 26... Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Jesus typically said things in an unstated fashion. He's saying very clearly that I am the Messiah. Because she said when the Messiah says, I am he, he's claiming he's the Messiah. It's interesting that he did this to a Samaritan woman and in Samaria. When he would not say that, 
till just before he was crucified among his own people, among the Jews in Jerusalem. Part of the reason why is because to say that in, in a Samaritan area where they had that belief that, yeah, there would be a prophet like Moses, but they didn't, they, they didn't see him necessarily, didn't have the political context. To make that statement to Judea, I am the Messiah, that, you know, it's an immediately you're going to have to deal with the Romans and all their collaborators, such as the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So Jesus was very careful how he presented himself in this. But the point that he's saying, for God is spirit, in verse 24, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So if we're going to worship God, if we're going to be perfect as he is perfect, we see that we must worship him in spirit and truth. You know, tonight is Halloween. I hope most of you are depriving yourselves of the opportunity to run around to your neighbors and ask for free candy. <laughs> I hope most of you have not put little skeletons and ghouls out front or put little uh, pressure uh, plates underneath your, your welcome mat by your front door so when somebody steps on it, it goes, <laughs> my, A lot of my neighbors have and done all those things. You know, little graveyards, uh, you know, hanging scenes, uh, skeletons, witches, black cats. And we'll have the kids wandering around because it's a dry day today. It's this beautiful sunny day. Too bad it wasn't last night because it was just raining cats and dogs. But it won't happen tonight, of course. You know, they'll all come by and we'll have the lights turned out. But if you're worshiping God in spirit and truth, are you going to keep Halloween? The ancient festival of my ancestors, the, the, the Celts, the Celts, in Ireland and Scotland and Wales. That's what they did. It was part of the pagan religion. I don't do that. And you know, I, I know it's not just in the Church of God movement that we don't do this. There's something like 11% of people who are, profess to be Christians, Christians uh, don't do something on Halloween. But that means there are 89% who do. If we're going to emulate the one who we call God, if we are going to be perfect, therefore, as our heavenly Father is perfect, we won't do something like Halloween. Because we are God is spirit, and those who worship him must, that's must, is an imperative word, must. Worship him in spirit and truth. Can't worship him with lies. We can't worship God with lies. Our society is living lies. Our society adores lies. We think they're fun. We think they're harmless. Don't we? We do it all the time, but that's just not true. It's just not true. If we're, going, if we're going to be perfect, we're going to live in spirit and in truth. When we have someone knock on our door and they open the door, you know, I have, I'm not dressed up, okay? I'm not putting on a mask or anything else. Years ago, I would go there and I would explain, I would say, I would actually engage them all, you know, and say, hey, come on over, I'd get their parents over, and I'd talk to them and say, I don't do Halloween, you know, and I would explain why I didn't do a Halloween. Now, you know, I, well, we, we did that for years, and uh, people thought we were exceedingly weird. But usually from this standpoint, um, because society has gotten worse and worse, and you, when kids go out trick-or-treating these days, usually the RCMP comes around and says, you go to only places that are seemingly welcoming you, okay? Because, I mean, they've done all sorts of nasty things from drugged, drugged candy, you know, razor blades in the apples to, I mean, all this has gone on before. I typically, we will say, if somebody does persist in ringing the doorbell, I'll say, I say, we are un-Halloween. <laughs> we are un-Halloween, you know? I don't keep the religion of my ancestors, okay, anymore. I mean, I'm a Celt, 
and background, and I, I don't do it. And that's where it comes from. I'll tell them straight up. Well, it's a corruption. All Saints, all, you know, All Saints Day. It's, it's you know, it's, it's, it's that's, but this, this is not a sermon about Halloween. We are, if we're going to emulate God, we're going to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. And that means we're, because God is a spirit, we will, he requires those who are going to come before him to worship him in spirit and in truth. He requires that, not with a lie. That is difficult for our society because our society wants to do it any way they feel like they want to do it or not do it. And this is a major problem from God's perspective, but that's why we're having problems in our society. So let's go to another one. If we're going to be perfect as God is perfect, then there's something else we're going to have to do because we're going to have to have in a part of our basic nature something that, that is of God. Let's go, to, let's go to Psalms 25. This is a Psalm of David. Let's turn over to Psalm 25. Psalm 25. David, a man after God's own heart. I'm going to read here again from the NRSV. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be put to shame. Do not let my enemies exult over me. Do not let those who, uh, uh, do not let those who wait for you be put to shame. Let them be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love. For they have been from of old. Do not remember the sins of of my youth or my transgressions, according to your steadfast love, remember me. But David is here making the point, God, because of your steadfast love, because of your mercy, he could approach him. He could, he could pray and be mindful of me. Remember me for your goodness sake, O Lord. Verse 8, good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. Good and upright is the Lord. The, this verse 8, the New Living Translation puts it this way. The Lord is good and does what is right. He shows the proper path to those who go astray. He leads the humble in doing right, teaching them his way. The Lord leads with unfailing love and faithfulness all who keep his covenant, all who live in the relationship that we can have with God and obey his demands. Yeah, there is an element of obedience that God requires of his people. There always has been an element of obedience from the time of the Garden of Eden. Our, our earliest ancestors had a choice between whether they were going to obey or not obey. For verse 11, For the honor of your name, O Lord, forgive my many, many sins. God is good. If we're going to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect, we're going to have to be good too. You know, Jesus said at one particular place, you know, no man is good, only God is good. But we're going to have to emulate and want to be that way ourselves. So that our reactions and what we do and how we behave, you know, is overall you can lump it all together and it's good. Because of this, you know, we think of God and we think of his character. We value, even in our personal life right now, we value a promise from somebody depending upon the character of the one who makes it. If you know the fellow is good with his word, isn't it valuable? If you know somebody is really flaky and promises you something, you walk out of his store or wherever it is, you say, yeah, right, you know. I can depend upon you. You find out even in, a, in, a, in our physical world right now how you work with, with tradespeople or vendors or the people you buy stuff from or stores, if their promises aren't any good, we don't value it. 
American dollar is a value, you know, when you accept an American or Federal Reserve note, it's a promise to pay you a dollar. It used to be in the old days, you got a silver certificate and they'd pay you a dollar's worth of silver, okay? Or, you know, if you could have been gold from that standpoint, they had gold certificates too. Now it's just a promise of, you know, that it's, a, it's, 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 uh, it's legal tender for debts, whatever. But, you know, in the United States, they've been living a lie a long, long time. The 1913 dollar has been devaluated about 95 percent. Five cents, uh, a 1913 five cent piece would buy what it costs us a dollar today to buy. Same start as when we're talking purchasing power. It's only worth, you know, five cents. Five cents! <laughs> We've been sold a lie. We've been, we, you know, the promise, the character of a particular government is, is, being, fall, is being found short. But we depend upon God's character. So we depend upon his promises. All the paths of the Lord, that is, all of his promises and all of the good things he does for us, they're all, we know what, are their mercy and their truth. In all of God's dealings with his people, you know, we see his mercy displayed in one form or another, don't we? How God deals with us. We see his word uh, fulfilled. Whatever the afflictions that we may face at this present time, we know that God comes through for us in the end. We know that God's mercy and truth will appear to us at journey's end, why don't we? We know that. God is faithful. He's true. We can depend upon his promises. He's good. And we're supposed to be good. We're supposed to emulate that as God is good himself. I think, you know, in, in today's paper, Jack Knox in the uh, Times columnist had an article about David Graham's journey. This man, he was a... It was, it's funny how your lives interweave a little bit. I didn't personally know David Graham. Uh, he died just a couple years ago. Um, but he's someone who just missed the cut to get on the Olympics rowing team, you know, in, in an eight-man, you know, rowing, you know, the, the, the skull or the, that they would have. My son did rowing at uh, UVic for a while, uh, Joshua, and uh, I listened to him talk about it. It's very, very physical sport, doing the rowing and for the Olympics or any sort of competitive whatever. And usually the guys who do this tend to be very big guys, although it's a very little boat that you're sitting on and you have to balance us. It's usually these big guys because they have these long muscles and they can lean forward and really get the power in this. And this, this fellow, David Graham, was shorter. Yeah, he was a Celt. He had red hair. Uh, he just didn't make it. He just missed out. He was number nine on it. But he became, eventually, uh, he was an extremely positive, uh, you know, uh, optimistic person, and he became a teacher, and he went to the private school system, and he was teaching out in the Chosen in the uh, Westmont School there, and then eventually in, uh, at Glen Lyons uh, Middle School in, in Victoria. Everyone, he was the type of person, and they say he put 10... 10 pounds worth of daily activity of trying to do things into a five pound sack. And uh, he burned out early because he did die at 47 from, from cancer, from this thing. But Jack Notch puts it, it's, uh, he took the example looking at David Graham's life and, and this whole thing with running the Olympic torch. He said, well, it's not so much the end destination, it's the journey. It's the journey. And for a Christian, you know, it's, Yes, the journey is important because we're to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect in our daily life. We're to strive for these things. We're to strive to live that, to be, you know, if you want to be thought of, thought of as good in our society. Somebody who would have, was thought of as good, such as David Graham, because of the way he, he, he encouraged and lifted the kids up. He didn't just, it wasn't the sort of school attitude where they'd beat you down and, and, you know, try to form you into a little mold and, and so that you come out of school and you hate it. He was that sort of positive person. But what Jack Knox doesn't know is the end of the journey, you know, isn't just a hole in the ground or incineration in a crematorium. There's far more to that. There is a destination for a Christian. For a Christian the destination matters. 
And because God is good, we can, and because of his character, we know we can depend upon his promises. They are worth our trust. Let's go to uh, John, the Gospel of John. Gospel of John, chapter 10. Gospel of John, chapter 10, and verse 14. I want to read this one out of the New Living Translation. That's the uh, Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 14. Jesus said this, I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep, and they know me. Just as my Father knows me, and I know the Father, so I sacrifice my life for the sheep. Jesus was willing to lay down his life. For all of us that are in this room, for all of those who are hearing us, Jesus did this long, long before we were even a spark in our dad's eye. <laughs> he did this all humanity, one who lived with the Father from eternity, who had everything. He had it made. He was willing to come and do everything for us. He's, he is the good shepherd. He is the good shepherd. If we're going to be perfect as God is perfect, so we're going to have to learn to be what? We're going to have to learn that we have to worship God in spirit and in truth. We're going to have to learn that to be good as God is good. We're going to have to learn what? Something else. Let's go to Isaiah 49.7. Isaiah 49.7. Isaiah 49 and verse 7. I'll read this one out of the Amplified Version. Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, chapter 49 and verse 7. So if we're going to be perfect as God is perfect, what's another characteristic of God that we have to emulate? Verse 7. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, Israel's Holy One, to him whom man rejects and despises, to him whom the nations abhor, to the servant of rulers, kings shall see you and arise, and princes they shall prostrate themselves, because the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you, the Lord who is faithful. If we're going to be perfect as God is perfect, we're going to have to prove faithful. Faithful. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 9. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 9. Again, the Amplified. Apostle Paul, here's a man who is beaten, suffered shipwreck, wandered about, living hand to mouth quite often, had a hard road in many ways in preaching the gospel, but he chose to do this because he knew who he was believing in. He knew that he could count on God's promises. And he says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 9. He says, God is faithful. It's an amplified version. It's faithful. It means reliable. It's trustworthy and therefore ever true to his promise. He can be depended on. He can be depended on. By him you were called into companionship and participation with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. God is faithful. And by him we're called into companionship and participation with his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. You know, all Christians are, by baptism, dedicated and devoted to Christ. That's what our baptism means. We're dedicated and devoted to Christ. 
and we are under strict obligation to be faithful and holy. So in the true church of God are all those who are called to be sanctified in Christ Jesus, who are called to be saints, and who call upon him as Jesus Christ, as God made manifest in the, sh- the flesh. And we're believing in all these blessings of salvation. We believe and we acknowledge Jesus Christ as our Lord and the Lord of everything. And we believe that because God is faithful, he will fulfill what he has promised in this book, which the world does not believe. The world thinks it was just written by men. You know, I read this week one uh, particular apologist, if you remember my sermon last week, a Jewish apologist. And he was, he took the Christian uh, scriptures and he was reconstructing them in the light of the Dead Sea Scrolls and whatever. And, you know, that Christianity is just was a, a form of Essenism and a few other of these things. And, you know, that, that was, it was material, is men just coming up with what they thought best or it's these other things. It's a whole different perspective. Doesn't see the truth behind it doesn't have the, the relationship with God, doesn't understand that God is faithful and holy and he would fulfill his promises and we could depend upon that as, because of his character, because he is good, because he is faithful. We know that by our baptism we are devoted to Christ. That's what, that's what it's all about. We have something we need to accomplish. If we're going to be like God is, if we're going to be perfect, as our Heavenly Father is perfect, we truly have our work cut out for us. We have a lot to do. And the basic nature of, of, of God, the basic part of his character, that he is good and that he is faithful, has to flow over into our own lives and what we do on a daily basis. Because that's what we are, and that's what we're to be. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians 5. 1 Thessalonians 5. And let's go to verse 12. Paul has this. He's, this is right at the close of his letter to the Thessalonians. And he was talking to them, of course, about end, a lot of end times things and things like this. And maybe it's a really appropriate epistle for us, because it certainly seems that uh, a lot of things are happening in the world these days. We're certainly much farther along as far as things are concerned than the Thessalonians. But Paul wrote this and he says this. In 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 12, he says, Dear brothers and sisters, so it's you. You can put your name in there. Insert your name because you are either a brother or a sister in Jesus Christ. Dear brothers and sisters, honor those who are your leaders in the Lord's work. They work hard among you and give you spiritual guidance. Show them great respect and wholeheartedly love, wholehearted love because of their work, and live peacefully with each other. Jesus said very clearly, men will know us as his disciples if we love one another. If we love one another, if we're good and faithful in our dealings with one another. Verse 14 Brothers and sisters, we urge you to warn those who are lazy, encourage those who are timid, take tender tender care of those who are weak, be patient with everyone. See that no one pays back evil for evil, but always try to do good to each other and to all people. Always be joyful. Have this positiveness that radiates from us. Never stop praying. Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Verse 19, do not stifle the Holy Spirit and do not scoff at prophecies, but test everything that is said and hold on to what is good. Stay away from every kind of evil. Now may the God of peace make you holy in every way. Set apart and sanctified. 
And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ come again. God will make this happen. That he will come again for he who calls you is faithful, Paul is saying. He is faithful. And we, in the meantime, as he's pointing out through all these exhortations of the church at that time, the things that they're to, to do to be perfect as their Heavenly Father is perfect. You know, it's, it's, it's an amazing thing. Verse 23, Now may the God of peace make you holy in every way. Why does he say that? Why does Paul say that? Well, besides being good and besides being faithful, God is what? He's holy. What is holy? Let's go to Leviticus 19. Leviticus chapter 19. Jesus said, some people might say, why are you sticking your nose in that old covenant, in that Hebrew Bible, that old covenant? Jesus said, however, in Matthew 4, 4, if you worship Jesus as the Christ, he says, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds forth from the mouth of the Lord. And when he said that, he was specifically referring to the Hebrew Bible and the book of Leviticus, which is part of the founding teaching of God. So you cannot take that perspective, and if you do, you forget what Jesus had to say. In Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 2, it says this, Speak to the congregation, to all the congregation of the people of Israel, the called out ones, those who are the prince, princes with God, and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. You know, that's an amazing concept. If we're going to be perfect, as our Heavenly Father is perfect, we must be holy. We're exhorted to be holy for you shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Now, what does this mean? You know, the kind of expression, and I'm going I'm to have fun, but I know Joe has got to go, you know, there, there, there's a lot of people say, I'm no holy, Joe. <laughs> Joe is holy, you know. I'm no holy, Joe, so I'll do as I please, you know, or whatever else, and I'll tell this off-color joke or swear or whatever else I need to do, okay, whatever it might be. But God is saying to us, no, I, the Lord your God, am holy, and you shall be holy too. For Israel, for ancient Israel, holiness meant far more than that which is unapproachable or completely separate or different. It became, it was a positive concept, a positive concept, an inspiration, a goal that was associated with God's nature and his character of who he was. And his desire that human beings become like him. See, the Bible is remarkably consistent. The divine narrative, right from the get-go, he is wanting us to be like him. This very early stage, he wants us to be like him. He wants us to be perfect. He wants us to live a life of godliness and, and imitating him as our father. You know, when you read through all of Leviticus 19, you see here, you know, it's, it's not a book. It's not a chapter of just little ritualistic do's and don'ts. I mean, it gives a series of ethical, and yes, there is ritual in it too, but the ritual is a teaching method and helps keeps us grounded in what is important. But it gives us ethical teachings about what is important, including something about the code of Leviticus 19.18. What? You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. I'm good. I love. I'm faithful. My word is good. What I say is good. We're to love our neighbor and be those things. 
while you're dealing with the ethical and perhaps ritual, there also soars in the midst of this the whole point of that we are to love all persons. Including aliens, in verse 34, God makes the point when, in verse 33, when an alien resides with you in your land, you shall not oppress the alien. The alien who resides with you shall be to you as a citizen among you, and you shall love the alien as yourself, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. How much different would our societies be here in North America or in Europe if we love the aliens in this way? It would be a lot different. If we love God and could teach actually the way of God, it would make a, we'd have a completely different world. The whole point in the way they understood it in the Old Covenant in the ancient Hebrews, the prophets certainly uh, understood this, that if we're going to be holy, holiness is love expressed in deeds, in our personal relationships, in how we organize and run our communities how we establish social justice. You know, in so many different things, you look at, uh, and I know, and going back to that whole thing of a financial news being scary, one of the things that they know how scary our world is and that we're in the last days, and these are secular people talking of our current system of organizing thing is because you know all the money is flowing to the top one percent one percent oh ninety percent of everything and we're just grinding and grinding away in the face of the poor and the aliens and the, the strangers we're to be perfect as God is perfect be holy be holy let's go to first Peter just so no one thinks just so no one thinks that uh, this isn't something for Christians or somebody who has this thought and does not understand that nature of God is remarkably consistent from the beginning to the end. He's trying to teach the same thing. He's trying to make this point. Peter is, does this. He quotes 1 Peter 1.13, which if you believe that Peter was a disciple and an apostle of God, then He's validating, of course, the Torah, he, the Leviticus, where we just quoted from, because he says this. In 1 Peter 1, in chapter 13, it says, Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Okay, he's, he's saying, just like in the Hebrew times, you must be active. It's essential. You're active. Discipline yourselves. Set all your hope on the grace that Jesus Christ will bring you when he is revealed. Because he's faithful after all. That's who he is. He's good. You can count on him. Like obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires you formerly had in ignorance. We all had bad desires in our old days. Self-seeking, selfishness of one form or another says in verse 15, Instead, as he who called you is holy, be holy yourselves in all your conduct. Where did Peter get that from? And this holiness is action. It's action. It's doing things. For it is written, you shall be holy. If you invoke as father the one who judges all people impartially according to their deeds... Live in reverent fear during the time of your exile. You know that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your ancestors. Yeah, things like Halloween. Pagan practices of one form or another. Lies, which are essentially just lies, idolatrous lies of one form. Anything that we put ahead of worshiping God in spirit and truth. The truth instead of lies. Oh, lies aren't cute. If you know that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, because he's good. He is the good shepherd. He was willing to sacrifice himself for us. 
that like a lamb without defect or blemish. He was destined before the foundation of the world, but was revealed at the end of the ages for your sake. Yeah, the divine narrative has been the same from the beginning to the end. They planned it. They planned where they wanted us to be. Through him you have come to trust in God because we know he's good. We know he's faithful. Through him you have come to trust in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are set in God. Now that you have purified your souls by obedience to the truth, because we must worship him in spirit and in truth, so that you have genuine mutual love, to love your neighbor as yourself. Love one another deeply from the heart. You have been born anew, not of a perishable but imperishable seed, through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all the glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Long after the Olympics here, 2010 in Vancouver, forgotten from memory, the word of God and those who will live by the word of God those who will be perfect as the Father are perfect, will be living and thinking and doing and acting just like our Father in heaven and our Lord Jesus Christ, good and faithful in all the things we're doing. And the word of the Lord endures forever. Brethren, as we come this next week and we're thinking about what we're doing, Let's, let's think a little caref carefully about emulating the one whom we call God.